In September of 1944, the Allied armies were advancing fast towards Germany. But a huge obstacle stood in their way. The River Rhine. An audacious plan to capture eight of the bridges across it in one fell swoop started well. But everything went disastrously wrong with the final quarry. The bridge at Arnhem. Twelve thousand airborne troops came by glider and parachute to fight for the bridge. It was the biggest airborne assault ever. But it didn't work. In fact, it would turn out to be one of the biggest disasters in the entire war. Of the 12,000 men who came here, only 3,900 got out again. However, the battle produced some of the most astonishing feats of bravery in British military history. One of the men fighting here was Major Robert Kane of the South Staffordshire Regiment. He arrived in the war zone by glider on September the 18th, just another ordinary man who'd given up his ordinary job to fight in the war. But 10 days after his glider landed in this very field, this ordinary man would have done something extraordinary. He would have won the world's highest award for valor, the Victoria Cross. It is almost impossible to win a VC. In the 150 years since it was created, the number of British and Commonwealth troops who've seen action is in the tens of millions. But only 1,351 of them have been awarded the Victoria Cross. The chances of surviving a VC action are just one in ten, but if you do survive, the medal can never be taken away from you. You can go to the gallows wearing it. And no matter how many letters you have after your name, VC always comes first. The VC, to my mind, has a place above all other national awards. It is the highest regarded award for gallantry. People have it in their minds that the Victoria Cross is something special, and anybody who's got the Victoria Cross must be somebody special. And they're right. I could have centred this programme on any VC winner. All of them are remarkable. But the most special for me is this man, Robert Kane. This then is his story, but it's also the story of the medal that he won. In official speak, the military say the Victoria Cross is awarded only for gallantry of the highest order. But what does that mean? Well, let me give you a typical example. This is the story of Lieutenant Ferdinand West, an RAF pilot who won his VC in the First World War. On August the 10th, 1918, West was flying his biplane far over the enemy lines when he was attacked by seven German aircraft. At the start of the fight, one of his legs was blown off by an explosive bullet and fell into the controls. West lifted his leg clear of the controls and, although wounded in the other leg, manoeuvred his machine so that his rear gunner was able to get several good bursts into the enemy aircraft and drive them off. All seven of them. 
Through sheer grit and determination, West then landed his plane safely, and although rapidly weakening and semi-conscious from the loss of blood, insisted on filing his report on the enemy troop positions before receiving medical attention. And the extraordinary thing is, the report here filed by his rear gunner said that he didn't know that the pilot had been wounded until after they landed. West never thought to mention that his leg had been blown off. The story of the VC began 150 years ago when Britain was in the thick of another empire-building dust-up, the Crimean War. There was huge bravery, but the system for rewarding this gallantry was a shambles. The medals that did exist were only for officers of a certain rank. There was nothing for the common man. Sometimes an ordinary soldier would be mentioned in dispatches, but that was no good because army commanders tended to list everyone who'd taken part. It was a bit like passing your chartered accountancy exams today. You get your name in the paper, but so does everyone else. The Crimean conflict, however, saw the advent of a new weapon to fight the cause of the foot soldier, the war correspondent. One of them was William Howard Russell from The Times. His stories from the front line meant that for the first time, people back home could read accounts about the immense bravery of the bloke next door. One of the people who read these reports was Captain Thomas Scoble, an MP, who proposed a motion in the Commons on December the 19th, 1854, that the Queen should create some kind of medal, an order of merit, he said, for distinguished and prominent personal gallantry, to which every grade an individual, from the highest to the lowest, may be admissible. Unfortunately, the idea met with strong resistance from army commanders. They argued that the success of the British Army was based on the discipline of its formations. And they didn't want a medal that recognised individual acts of heroism in case it encouraged soldiers to break ranks and disappear off on their own. However, the top brass was about to be outgunned. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert saw the sense of Scoble's idea and told the War Office to come up with a plan. Not being terribly adventurous or enthusiastic, the civil servant suggested something traditional, an ancient order of some kind, perhaps. This is the document that they prepared. And as you can see from the notes and the squiggles put on it by Prince Albert, he was less than impressed. You can see here he's crossed out this bit where it refers to the order because he didn't want it to be seen like joining a Masonic lodge. Here in the margin, look, he's, he's actually referred to it as a cross granted for distinguished service which will make it simple and intelligible. That is very forward thinking for the time. And here he even suggests a name for it, the Victoria Cross. Nearly a hundred years after Prince Albert wrote those words, Major Robert Kane was preparing to go into battle at Arnhem. He was no career soldier, just an oil company executive from the Isle of Man. So, what sort of chap was he? He was very kind and he had a great sense of humour. I used to drink in the bar. He always bought the drinks. Well, my strongest memory is that you, you hadn't got to be frightened of him that you could go to him and speak to him of anything. I would personally, if I'd been asked to follow anyone, I'd have followed Robert Kane. I had complete confidence in man. The battle plan that brought Kane to Arnhem was called Operation Market Garden, and it was very simple. Allied forces would parachute into Holland and seize a line of strategic bridges. This would create a highway that would allow the second army to charge north over the enemy defence lines and down into Germany itself. 
The war, it was said, would be over in a matter of weeks. Now, the most difficult bridge to capture would be the one furthest north, in the Dutch city of Arnhem. But a small band of British paratroopers from the first wave of landings did manage to capture the north end of what's now known as the Bridge Too Far. Major Kane arrived in this field 24 hours after the first landings. There'd been a problem with his glider back in England, but his job remained the same. He had to get his company of 22 men to the bridge as fast as possible to help out. Sounds simple, but it wasn't. First of all, the whole point of airborne troops is surprise. You don't know they're coming until they're there. But because Kane arrived 24 hours after the first wave, the surprise was gone. And to make matters worse, the landing zone was some eight miles from the bridge. So, thanks to some incompetent planning from the top brass in England, the Germans knew that Kane and his men were coming, they knew where he'd landed, they knew where he was going, and they had the wherewithal to do something about it. By sheer coincidence, the German army had parked two divisions just outside Arnhem. That meant tanks, artillery guns, half-tracks and 12,000 SS Panzer troops. Lined up against this wall of armour was the airborne British soldier, who, by the nature of his job, travelled light. He only had a stem gun or rifle, knives, grenades, only a few anti-tank weapons were brought, because no one thought they'd be needed. The British troops simply didn't know about the strength of the German opposition as they started out on the eight-mile walk to the bridge. Kane's men made it with no real problems at all to this very spot, just 2,000 yards from the bridge. They could actually see it over there, and they could almost certainly hear the small company of British soldiers fighting to hold on to the northern end, but they couldn't get there. The Germans had had all the time in the world to get ready, and they were ready. Down there, on the other side of the river, they had artillery. On the other side, up there behind that modern building, there's a piece of high ground. They'd put mortars on that. Dead ahead were tanks and infantry. In desperation, some of the British tried to run down this bank, but there were more tanks and more infantry down there on the lower road. This was the perfect place for an ambush. The British had walked right into it, and they were slaughtered. <laughs> Of the 400 South Staffs who fought here, only a hundred would escape. Kane called it the regiment's Waterloo. Two of his close friends were among the casualties, and in his diary he wrote, for the first time since childhood, tears sprang in my eyes. I turned away, swallowing hard, and with rage in my heart. It must have been a savage kind of rage because on his way back down this road for more ammunition, he ran into a party of five Germans. And even though he was alone, he opened up with his Bren gun and killed all of them. Later on, the easygoing married father of two wrote of the killings, I cannot describe the surge of dreadful, unholy joy which I felt. When he got back, the battle scenes were horrific. He wrote, We passed Taffy Williams, a grand little Welshman and one of my originals. Only his head and face were untouched. The rest of him was unrecognisable. And so, with his company decimated, Kane was ordered to retreat. He'd bagged five Germans single-handed, but that made him a soldier, not a hero. There was still no hint that this man would win a Victoria Cross. This, the world's ultimate medal, was deliberately designed to be simple.
In fact, when it was unveiled in 1857, the critics were horrified. The Times called it poor-looking and mean in the extreme. People were used to medals like chandeliers, as big and as glitzy as firework night. It was always assumed that the grander the medal, the brighter it should be. This is the actual prototype of the VC, made to Prince Albert's specifications, a simple cross. Now, when Queen Victoria saw it, she loved it. In fact, if we look on a real one, which I've got here, we can see the only change she made is to the bar. She added some laurel leaves and a little V. And that's it. The highest award for gallantry. Strangely, the metal from which all VCs are made is not kept at the palace or under the Bank of England. It's to be found here, at an army supply base near Telford in Shropshire. It's in these sinister buildings that the army stores its rifles, its machine guns, its artillery pieces, its nuclear and chemical warfare suits. A quarter of a million items with a combined value of £1.4 billion. Enough to win a small war. Bear in mind that what you're looking at here is just one aisle, and there are eight aisles in every unit, and there are four units in every building, and there are 20 buildings. The security is fearsome, but even so, the most precious thing they have here is kept in its own safe. A safe with its own alarm and its own all-seeing CCTV camera. This is it. It's a lump of bronze from a Chinese-made cannon that was captured from the Russians at Sevastopol in the Crimean War. And it's from this lump of metal that all Victoria Crosses are made. Now, you'd expect the delicate job of creating a VC to be handled by a household name like Garrard's or Asprey. But no. Every time a new batch of medals is needed, a slice is peeled from the original lump and taken by military escort to a tiny jeweller's in London's Burlington Arcade. Hancock's have made the medal since the day it was created, and it's always given their craftsmen a bit of a headache. It's made of very insignificant, valueless metal. The metal itself is, I suppose the right word is unstable. It, it's not nice metal, like pure copper or pure silver or pure gold or even pure bronze. It, it comes, as most people seem to know, from cannons which were um, captured. So it's already been used once, and the more often you use it, the less stable it becomes. Down in the vaults of this jewellers, you will find seven VCs, the last of a batch that was cast over 30 years ago. They're all unengraved. They're all waiting for an owner. All VCs are going to look alike. But what makes them unique, of course, is the information on the back the engraving of the man's name and regiment and the date. And until they are issued, they are literally valueless. 1942, 3, 4, that sort of time, um, Hancock's were charging £1.10, £1.50 in, in our modern language, to each of the services. And now a VC, which may have cost those sorts of sums in 1943, could well be worth on the market £150 to £200,000. 
fact, it does actually become priceless once it's been issued because it can be identified for a particular man on a particular day in a particular action. And it's the history which is carried forward. So, as a piece of jewellery, the Victoria Cross is worthless. But as Queen Victoria understood all along, the medal itself isn't important. It's the story that goes with it that matters. And back in Arnhem, Major Robert Kane's VC story was about to begin. Despite the losses suffered by Kane and the South Staffs in the German ambush earlier that day, the British still saw this as a setback rather than a defeat. And Kane's next task was to come here to a nearby hill called Den Brink. His orders were to seize the hill, hold it, and use the high ground to provide covering fire. Kane made it to the high ground, no problem at all. But he and his men couldn't dig protective trenches because, unsurprisingly, the whole area was crisscrossed with tree roots. Look, they're everywhere. And all they had were these pathetic little trenching tools. So they were completely exposed when the tanks came. It was another massacre. Tank shells and mortar fire rained down on Kane's men who couldn't find any protection in the ground. For the second time in a day, he was forced to retreat, writing later, it would have been a sheer waste of life to stay there. I felt extremely dejected. I knew our particular effort to get through to the bridge had been a failure. Kane took a hundred men to the top of that ridge, but when he came down, 90 minutes later, 40 of them were gone. Now, he says he was dejected, but eyewitnesses say he was anything but. They say he was bloody angry. Robert Kane, the affable man who bought the drinks in the bar, had now become an angry warrior. So is anger the fuel which stokes the fire of a VC winner? Many VCs are won uh, in the heat of the moment, and undoubtedly the adrenaline uh, gets going and inspires people, but, uh, and uh, their emotions will come up to the top, and anger is likely to be one of them, because it will, um, it, they've been seeing their own people being killed. And, but I believe very firmly that the, a VC winner has complete focus on the job in hand, and he, he may have these emotions, but he's got them under control. Anger without being under control uh, is a useless uh, emotion to have. But anger controlled and directed towards defeating the enemy is a most effective weapon. This man is a classic example. In November 1965, Rambahada Limbu, a lance corporal in the Gurkhas, was fighting in the Indonesian war. During one battle, he ran across 60 yards of open ground, completely exposed to a hail of murderous machine gun fire, so he could rescue a wounded soldier. It seemed to onlookers like a suicidal run the first time, but then he did it all over again to come back with a second soldier. And then again for a third time to retrieve their Bren gun, which he used to charge down and kill the enemy. He won his Victoria Cross in just 20 minutes and afterwards said that it was the anger of seeing his friends wounded that had driven him on. Limbu is a rare breed, one of only 15 VC winners who are still alive today. They've all faced death in its most horrendous way, almost obvious way, and they've cheated death, and they don't have to prove anything to anybody. They're, they're at peace with themselves. If anyone can shed light onto the character of a VC winner, it's the secretary to the Victoria Cross and George Cross Association, Didi Graham. She's known more VC winners than anyone else. The principal common quality amongst Victoria Cross holders I've known is an overriding humility and the huge 
inner strength which doesn't need to show off or throw their weight around in any way at all. Commander Ian Fraser typifies this modesty. In 1945, he and his crew piloted a midget submarine through 80 miles of mined waters in their mission to blow up the Japanese cruiser Takao. In order to sink it, they had to place their explosives right under its keel, but the operation went wrong when the tide went out and the 13,000-ton cruiser settled onto the tiny submarine, pinning it to the sea bed. When we got stuck and the tide was going out and the cruiser sat down on us, then I really got worried because I wasn't quite sure how I was going to get out because uh, I was still determined to get out the other side. And we sort of went full ahead on the engine and full of stir on the motor, sorry, full ahead on the motor, full of stir. And we dug a trench in the, in the, in the seabed by going backwards and forwards. And eventually we, we came out from underneath it. Fraser and his crew did manage to blow up the cruiser and escape. And it's yet another amazing VC story. But he doesn't see it that way. It always appeared to me that I was doing something that I'd been trained to do. I mean, I'd, I'd worked for months with this team of people that I had in the boat, 12 of them all together, only four in the boat at any one time. And we'd work for months on attacking ships, sticking limpet mines on the... Then you go and do it in an action, and they give you a VC for doing it. It, it all seemed... Uh, it always seems a bit, seems a bit, um, a bit odd to me. I've never come across a Victoria Cross holder who said that they felt that they definitely did earn that award. Another common characteristic is that they all seem to show a sense of responsibility. There's an interesting statistic with the uh, VCs, uh, which is that 75% of them were the responsible child of an early widowed mother or the responsible child in a large family. So it means that they spent their whole of their childhood looking after their siblings or their mother. So they're used to taking, uh, looking after other people and not thinking of themselves. I was feeling probably more from a soldier than anything else, you know. Uh, uh, I was a, uh, I was just there. I was a secondary, secondary thing to the, to the whole thing. Uh, and, I, and I was uh, upset that I was losing soldiers uh, and the enemy was shooting my wounded. In 1969, during the Vietnam War, Warrant Officer Keith Payne was leading a company of trainee soldiers when they were attacked and routed by massively superior Viet Cong forces. Separated from his fellow officers and wounded, Payne went behind enemy lines time and time again to rescue as many of his raw recruits as he could. That night, he saved the lives of 40 men. I felt that it was my responsibility to get my soldiers out of that situation uh, and not ask anybody else to go and do it. So VC winners do seem to have some things in common, a responsibility for others and a temper, perhaps. But does that mean they're all the same? Does that mean there's a type? Well, the truth is it's almost impossible to say. It could be something in the water. There's one street in Canada that's provided us with three winners. It could be something in the blood. Four times it's been won by people whose brothers had already won it, and three times by people whose fathers had already won it. It's been won by rogues, scoundrels, introverts, extroverts, aristocrats. You probably think you don't have it in you to win one, but you probably do. Once people do meet us, we're just ordinary people. They know we're ordinary people and we're, you know, uh, shave and all the rest of the things that uh, people do. Uh, but uh, I think they also recognise the fact that uh, uh, we've been tested and uh, stood up to the test. In Holland in 1944, Major Robert Kane had been tested twice, but worse was to come. This was the picture at Arnhem. 40 miles to the south, the second army, seen here in red, was bogged down. And with reinforcements unable to get through, the men holding the north end of the bridge were soon to surrender. 
Kane and the remaining airborne troops were ordered to pull back three miles west to the village of Osterbeek. A horseshoe of defences was then erected in the hope of holding off the Germans until the Second Army could break through. So, picture the scene. Try to put yourself in the head of someone who was here that day. You were part of the largest airborne assault ever, but your mission has been a complete failure. That's the first thing. You were supposed to have been here two days, but you've been here for four. You landed with 12,000 men, but at this point only 3,900 are left. So it's almost certain that you've watched close friends get killed. You've been fighting pretty much non-stop for those last four days, so it's unlikely you've had any sleep. You've no food. You're low on ammunition. And the Germans have cut off the water supply to the village that you hold up in. And there's no way out of the village because you're surrounded on all sides by tanks and artillery and mortars and flamethrowers and 6,000 German troops. And then someone gets a radio working and you find out that the Second Army, which was supposed to have been here two days earlier, is still five days away. Imagine how that must have felt, that sense of desolation and isolation, that sense of, well, we're going to die here. To make matters even worse, the RAF was dropping vital supplies of food and ammunition at prearranged landing zones, not realising they'd been overrun by Germans. The British soldiers in Osterbeek actually watched almost 90% of the drops fall into enemy hands. So the Germans must have felt optimistic, but they were reckoning without Robert Kane. His job was to defend the tip of the horseshoe by the river. This was the short straw, because if the Germans came through here, they'd cut everyone off, and the Brits would be finished. That night, an eerie silence descended on the bridge. Everyone knew that meant the British holding the North End had finally surrendered, and as a result, the Germans could now turn all their attention to the siege of Osterbeek. What's more, as the British forces grew weaker, the Germans were being reinforced with men and equipment from home. Equipment that included their most formidable battle weapon. The Tiger tank was the king of the German divisions, the biggest armoured vehicle they'd ever made. It weighed 57 tonnes, its armour plating was four inches thick. The shells it fired were from an 88mm gun. It could blow anything to kingdom come with complete impunity. And a herd of them was headed straight for Kane's position. On the second day of the siege, a Tiger tank rumbled down the street at the top of that bank over there. Now, Major Kane was down here on this piece of waste ground, armed with a Piat gun. The British troops hated these things. It was a botched piece of design. It was heavy, it was ungainly, it was inaccurate, and the shell it fired was virtually useless against all known sorts of German armour. And those were the good things about it. The, uh, the bad thing was trying to cock it. You had to stand on the end like that and then pull it up to tighten the spring, which isn't so bad now because the spring's 60 years old and quite weak. But back then, that would often take two guys. And then, once it was done, you had to seat the shell, which meant feeding it in like this. It's immensely fiddly even today. So what it must have been like when you had 50 tonnes of Tiger tank bearing down on you. Isn't that thinking about? Kane managed to load the Piat by himself and take up position behind a little hut. He waited for the tiger to be 30 yards away, took aim and fired. It was a good shot. The shell went right underneath the tank and blew up, causing no damage whatsoever. All it did was alert the crew inside to the fact that he was there. 
A shell from the tank's 88mm gun blew the hut to smithereens, but at the last second, Kane grabbed his Piat gun and ran for cover past the tank's machine gun to a laundry. And once he got there, he reloaded the Piat and got ready to fire it again. The second shot was as good as the first, but the effect was exactly the same as well. Nothing. So the tank turned its gun again and fired again. And this time it killed Kane's spotter, Lieutenant Ian Meutler. Now, at this point, a sane man would have got out of there. But you've got to remember, Kane had lost a hundred of his men by this stage. He wasn't in the mood for getting out. So, as the dust cleared, no one could quite believe their eyes because he was lying in completely open ground, facing down a tiger tank. I was close enough to see exactly what happened. I think he altered his position to kneeling, and we can see in the distance uh, a tank. I was absolutely certain he, he was going to die there. Kept on shouting, load, load, and firing at the tank. He fired for a third time, and this time, his shell hit the tiger's only Achilles heel. He blew one of its tracks off, immobilising it. And you could see the track of the tank come away and lob on its sides. Kane had no time to celebrate, though, because almost immediately, another tiger rolled into view on the road up there. He dived behind the wall of the laundry again, reloaded his piat again, and then stepped out to take a shot at it. But he pulled the trigger a fraction of a second too soon. So the shell clipped the wall of the laundry and blew up just a few feet in front of his face. There was a flash, and he immediately fell over. And it was horrifying. When I got to him, his face was black, but totally black, and with little pink of spots of blood all the way around. What, 30, 40, 50, whatever it was. And uh, he was saying, I'm blind, I'm blind, I can't see. So several of his men carried him away to the cops, 10, 15 yards away. I stayed with him no more than six or seven paces, I shouldn't think, holding his hand. It seemed like he was finished. But 45 minutes later, he was back. His sight had returned, and that was enough. The shrapnel wounds he would cope with. And this chap came out of the copse with his face blackened. And he got down immediately on the pier gum. I was staggered, utterly staggered. I thought, well, he must be a very brave man to be knocked out, probably, and then come back and take up the same position and still hit tanks. I couldn't understand why such a brave man didn't say, well, I've had enough. He'd done his lot and still kept going and going. But he was still far when we left. By the end of that day, day two of the siege, Kane, according to eyewitnesses, had destroyed three tanks. and No one had ever done that before. He had begun to win his VC. This lump of bronze is only big enough to produce 80 more medals. But there's no need to panic about it running out just yet, because over the years it's become harder and harder to win a Victoria Cross. In the early days, simply whirling your sword at a heathen was often enough, but that changed toward the end of the First World War, and the figures back this up. In World War I, 634 medals were awarded, but in World War II, that dropped to just 182. The bar had been raised to an almost impossible height. During the Arnhem battle, a glider pilot called Lieutenant Mike Dornsey found himself defending a sector very close to where Robert Kane was. Here's the report. Uh, it says the position was continually attacked by superior forces of enemy tanks and infantry. On three occasions, the enemy overran the sector, necessitating a counterattack.
Dorsey led each sortie with such determination that the positions were regained with heavy loss to the enemy. In the face of heavy small arms and mortar fire, he personally attacked machine gun posts with complete disregard for his own safety. The next day, uh, the Germans attacked again with uh, tanks and self-propelled guns. This time, Dornsey lost the sight of one eye. In spite of the pain, though, he refused to be evacuated. And then on the next day, they came back with tanks again. His men withdrew and he was left alone facing down a tank. He threw a gammon bomb through its hatch and blew it up. Now, for this, he was recommended for a VC, but they turned him down. That's how hard it had become to win one. Since the end of the Second World War to the present day, only 11 VCs have been won, and this creates a problem. The fewer VC winners there are, the greater the burden of living in its spotlight. I'd sooner have back with me the pals, my buddies, my comrades back with me rather than any medal. In 1951, Private William Speakman was part of a battalion of the Black Watch Regiment defending a hilltop in Korea. The hill was attacked by 6,000 Chinese soldiers and with the Black Watch troops outnumbered by 12 to 1, the situation looked bleak. But as the hill was about to be overrun, Speakman appeared like a 6 foot 4 inch human grenade launcher. And I thought, well, all this stuff has been done. We've primed them. I, I might as well use the bloody things, you know. So uh, that's it. And we went up there and we, we just did it. Ten times he went back for more grenades, and then when they ran out, he lobbed beer bottles and ration tins at the Chinese, anything he could get his hands on. Eventually the attack was broken, and Speakman was a hero, but he found it hard to cope with the attention the VC brought. He told one reporter that the medal made him feel like a freak in a freak show. Sometimes it gets a little bit too much. Not sometimes, a lot of the time it gets too much. You, um, people try, try to do something for you. They try to say thank you in their own little way. They say, well, tell me what happened. You, you just, you either don't want to, or you just, sometimes you just say, well, no, it's, uh, I've forgotten all about it now. And that's the truth. It's a bit overwhelming for an ordinary person. The difficulty with the Victoria Cross or uh, an award of that standing being awarded is you, you were just beginning to get over the shock and the horror of what you've been through. And then you're given this award and you have to relive it all over again, probably for the rest of your life, because people will be asking you about it for the rest of your life. They're just incredible people. Uh, I'm being soft about them because they, they were tough men that day. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've, you know, when I first started um, being involved with the association, there were 450 alive, and now there are only 15. So there's been a lot of sadness. Um, but I've, we've had some incredible times together. <laughs> The last two VCs, both posthumous, were won in the Falklands War 21 years ago. And the reason it's been such a long time is quite straightforward. Modern warfare with remote control weapon systems arguably separates you from the enemy in a way that hasn't happened in past wars. It gives you an idea of how rarely you can justify a VC and how uh, infrequently the opportunity, and it doesn't need an opportunity, the opportunity to win a VC comes past your door. The days of soldiers sticking their heads above the parapet and taking out half the enemy with nothing but a fruit knife are gone. The days of soldiers like this man, Gurkha rifleman Lackeyman Gurung. In Burma, on May the 13th, 1945, Gurung was manning the most forward post of his platoon when 200 Japanese soldiers attacked the position. Grenades were thrown into his trench which Rifleman Gurung snatched up and threw back. 
Unfortunately, the third grenade exploded in his hand, blowing off his fingers, shattering his right arm and severely wounding him in the face, body and right leg. For the next four hours, wave after wave of fanatical attacks were thrown in by the enemy and all were repulsed. Even though Gurung, alone in his trench, had to load and fire his rifle using only his left hand. Of the 87 enemy dead counted in the vicinity after the battle, 31 lay in front of Gurung's position. 31. So, is the greatest medal in the world in danger of becoming extinct? Will those seven in the safe at Hancock's jewellers ever be engraved? I think it would be quite wrong uh, to say that uh, there will never be an opportunity for a Victoria Cross to be won in future warfare. There will be opportunities. There will always be personal braveries in an intensive operation, a long drawn out operation, that deserves that reward. There would be certainly plenty in this generation who would be candidates for being awarded the Victoria Cross. Courage isn't lost from mankind. It's just, just the circumstances. Back on the banks of the Rhine, Major Robert Kane was into the third day of the siege of Osterbeek and the Germans had changed their tactics. Possibly fed up with losing so many tanks, they decided to batter the British into submission with constant shelling and mortar fire. The Germans by this stage had ringed the British positions with a hundred artillery guns along with twelve of the dreaded Nabelwerfers, multi-barreled mortars which fired six bombs at a time. Somehow this bombardment seemed to inspire Kane, driving him to ever greater feats of bravery. While most of the troops kept their heads down and their fingers crossed, hoping a shell wouldn't land on them, he went in search of tanks. Witnesses spoke of a madman running through a hailstorm of fire in these very streets with his trousers torn off, blood pouring from wounds in his legs, firing his piet at tank after tank after tank. And they said he's falling, the, some were saying he's falling in the pit from the hip, like a bloody cowboy. There was this figure, wounded, bandaged, dirty, dishevelled, but still coming round, still wherever the point of danger was, still encouraging the men all the time. Some were saying he'd knock four, five, six tanks out. Yeah, you can put yourself in the Germans' position and say, whoever's knocking out these tanks must be... <laughs> well... So someone out of this world, I think. <laughs> in his diary, he says his feet felt like they had a thousand pins sticking in them and that his socks filled with blood. Later in the day, he says he felt something hot and sticky running down the side of his face. Turns out he'd fired so many shells, one of his eardrums had burst. He disregarded his own wounds. He was wounded, seriously wounded and bleeding and, and torn to shreds, yet... Uh, he fought on because that was his duty. He refused to go back for medical treatment until there was a lull in the battle. He fought with a total focus on what he was meant to be doing and many VC holders have this sense of focus. They, they have a focus that sees that clearly what they've got to do and they must do that regardless of the effect it has on his own life. And this selflessness is perhaps the, mo the key issue in winning a VC. To understand just how important this business of selflessness is, you need to know the story of John Cruikshank. Cruikshank was the captain of a Catalina flying boat, which was very badly shot up during a suicidal attack on a U-boat. Although he sank the U-boat, one of his crew was killed, three others injured, and Cruikshank himself was hit 72 times including wounds to both lungs. So there he is, with his lungs hemorrhaging, slipping in and out of consciousness and barely able to breathe. But he was determined to bring the wounded crew home safely, so he kept the plane in the air for an hour until the sea conditions were safe enough for a landing. And that's an amazing story. 
but it's not as amazing as what the Secretary of State has written here. He says, I think that the VC has been earned in this case, although an element of self-preservation enters into it. And that's the tricky bit. You see, if you're the captain of an aeroplane, you bring it back and therefore save the lives of everyone on board. You also save your own life. You can't really win. Arnhem was a lost cause too. There were so many wounded British soldiers by the fourth day of the siege that the Germans sportingly arranged a ceasefire so they could be evacuated. Kane could have gone. He was a wreck. He was half blind, he was half deaf, his legs were perforated with machine gun and shrapnel wounds. But he chose to stay, and that meant he was still here on the fifth day of the siege. This, in the Germans' eyes, was doomsday, the day when they'd mount their biggest push. They threw everything at the British. Tanks, artillery, flamethrowers, mortars, the lot. The British had arrived in Arnhem with supplies for three days. This was their ninth and the fifth in the hell of Oosterbeek. It was shaping up to be the shortest firefight in history. But Major Kane had other ideas. Kane found himself down by the church, and pretty soon he was out of ammunition for his Piat. So he switched to a mortar like this. Now, the idea of a mortar is that you jam it into the ground, you drop the shell into the tube, it fires up in the air and lands on the German positions. But the Germans were so close that he was firing it like this, like a normal gun. Now, imagine what that must have looked like from a German's point of view. This man with his trousers blown off, caked in blood with sticky stuff coming down the side of his face, firing a mortar horizontally at you. It must have been unnerving. In Kane's VC citation, it says of the events of that day, by a skillful use of this weapon and his daring leadership of the few men still under his command, he completely demoralised the enemy, who, after an engagement lasting more than three hours, withdrew in disorder. Robert Kane had turned the tide in the battle, and this is another vital factor in winning a Victoria Cross. Your actions have to create a ripple effect. They have to help save the day. On the Monday, it was the final day of the battle, and the Germans, that was 9th SS Panzer Division, had been trying for since the Friday to break Major Kane's block because that was the key to cutting us off from the, the whole division off from the river and we would have been finished. We all knew that, I mean, it was obvious to us all, but he made sure that they didn't get through um, to his great credit. His action had tremendous impact on the troops as a whole and probably uh, helped them keep their resolve and help win the battle out of proportion to the size of his own personal command. It was the most wonderful example to everyone. A major firing at tanks is, is something you don't hear of, really. We all wanted to emulate him, of course, um, which we tried to do to our best ability. The, the effect that uh, Major Robert Kane had on the men was obviously his leadership and the fact that they were on the defensive, but he was moving, he was uh, showing himself, he was rallying where there was the greatest danger, and that has the most uh, huge impact upon people who have just got to stay there and endure and be brave. They need something to focus upon. He was that focus. He led by example completely. I mean, I'm sure that whoever got back over that river of the South Staffords could owe that fact to Bob Kane and nobody else because it was his example that rallied them. His bravery was suicidal and utterly selfless. His tank-killing antics rallied the troops, beat off the enemy and helped keep the defences at Osterbeek intact. These were the reasons why this man won a Victoria Cross. And not just any VC either. 
According to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Derek McCarty, it was the finest Victoria Cross of the whole war. After the Germans withdrew, the British, out of ammo, food and ideas, and knowing by this stage that the Second Army wasn't coming, silently crossed the river at night to safety. Kane knew they were retreating, but he didn't want to look beaten. When they were in utter defeat by the river, withdrawing over the river, the battle was lost. He found a razor and somehow he shaved so that at least he would go back looking respectable and like an officer above his men. Amazing man. Kane was awarded his Victoria Cross at Buckingham Palace on the 2nd of November 1944, the first Manxman ever to get one. But like many other VC winners, he was never very comfortable with all the ballyhoo and fuss. Kane was the only one of five VC winners at Arnhem who lived to tell the tale. Not that he would tell the tale, of course. VC winners rarely do. And that's a pity, because Kane's tale is one of how many more young men, how many more teenage soldiers might have died had he not fought quite so ferociously. After the war, he left the army and went back to working for Shell in Nigeria and the Far East. He died of cancer in 1974. Sadly, that meant I never met him, which is a shame for two reasons. Firstly, because I'm absolutely fascinated by VC winners. And secondly, because I'm married to his daughter. She didn't even know he'd won a Victoria Cross until after he died. He never thought to mention it. You know, we've a rather warped sense of what constitutes bravery these days. I mean, even David Beckham is called a hero for scoring a penalty. But when you look at VC winners and hear their stories, well, Enough said. A couple of years ago, I made a TV programme about my father-in-law who won a Victoria Cross at Arnhem. And since then, I've been on the hunt for a follow-up, another nugget of incredible heroism in the face of impossible odds. Of course, most war stories are well-known, well-documented and well-celebrated. The Battle of Britain, Rook's Drift and so on. But one day, while trolling through a second-hand bookshop, I came across a story that's hardly known or celebrated at all. It's the story of an amazing battle, a battle where more VCs were earned more quickly than any other action in the Second World War. It's a story full of ingenuity, pluck and genuine courage. It had the lot. Having read it, I decided to do some digging. And it turned out that while very few people in the outside world know anything about this extraordinary battle, they certainly do in military circles. And they call it the greatest raid of all. In 1941, the Battle of Britain 
Britain was won, but the Battle of the Atlantic was still raging, and we were losing. German U-boats were running amok among the convoys bringing supplies from America. Nine million tons of shipping had already been sunk, and the shipyards in Britain simply couldn't replace it fast enough. Britain was beginning to starve. Winston Churchill said in his diaries, the only thing that truly frightened me in the war was the U-boat peril. Said he was even more anxious about the Battle of the Atlantic than he was about the Battle of Britain. And then into the equation sailed the Tirpitz. Tirpitz was the fastest and most modern battleship in the war. Even though her armor was a foot thick, she could thunder along at 30 knots. And with eight 15 inch guns, she packed a huge punch. Certainly, the Royal Navy had very little in its arsenal to take on a ship of this magnitude. And that was a nightmare for the people who worked here, in Churchill's war rooms. Each of these dots on this map represents a convoy movement. If Tirpitz got among them beyond the range of the Royal Air Force, we would almost certainly lose the war. It was that simple. There was, however, a drawback to Tirpitz's size. You see, if she were to be damaged while out in the middle of the Atlantic, she couldn't very well go back to Germany for repairs, because that would mean limping past Britain, past the RAF, past our coastal fleet, and that would be a death sentence for her. So she'd have to go to a dry dock on the Atlantic coast of France. But there was only one dry dock on the Atlantic coast of France that was big enough to handle a ship of Tirpitz's size. This one. This is the Normandy dock in Saint-Nazaire. It had been built in the 30s when France was making giant ocean liners. And now, to make sure the Tirpitz could never have a home on the Atlantic seaboard, it had to be destroyed. Now, the only way that you could put this dock out of action is to destroy this gate. And that was a problem. It couldn't be done with a naval bombardment because the mouth of the estuary is actually six miles away in that direction. It couldn't be done with a submarine because this whole area was crisscrossed with anti-submarine nets. It couldn't be done over land because northern France was in German hands. And for two reasons, it couldn't be done from the air either. Firstly, Second World War bombing raids were notoriously inaccurate. Only 22% of bombs landed within five miles of the target. So the chances of being able to hit a dock gate from 6,000 feet in the sky were slim at the best of times. And it wouldn't be the best of times because right next door to the dry dock were 14 U-boat pens. These were some of the most precious facilities in the German armory. And to protect them, the Saint-Nazaire area bristled with 80 anti-aircraft guns and artillery pieces. And in the town itself, there were 5,000 troops. Destroying the dock then using conventional forces, the army, the air force, the navy, out of the question. So, the job was given to a group of men who really had only just been put together. The commandos. The commandos were the brainchild of Churchill, who'd seen similar outfits operate successfully in both the Boer War and the First World War. A small number of highly trained soldiers would get in fast, do a huge amount of damage, and then get out before the enemy had time to get organized. Churchill liked this. He called it the butcher and bolt approach. So what kind of men were they? 
Well, if popular myth is anything to go by, they were lantern-jawed killing machines who could headbutt their way through oak doors. The reality, though, was rather different. Gerard Brett in my regiment was in my commando, 12th commando, and he'd written a book on the Byzantine age or Byzantine architecture or something. One fellow who got a divinity degree from Trinity College, Dublin. Lance Corporal Potts had been a, a don at either Oxford or Cambridge. They included a poacher, a TT, motorcycle rider, so a mixed bag. What they represented was a complete revolution in the concept of soldiering. Because they were chosen for their individuality, their intelligence, their initiative. And nobody embodied that ethos more than this man, Mickey Byrne. I've got his autobiography here, and what a life. He had a privileged upbringing, Winchester, Oxford, uh, and then he met Guy Burgess, the chap who went on to become a Soviet spy, and they became lovers. Uh, Mickey, though, became a Nazi sympathiser, went to Germany, met Hitler, got a signed copy of Mein Kampf, and was one of the very first people to be shown around Dachau, the concentration camp. He knew Bertrand Russell, he knew Audrey Hepburn, he knew the King and Queen, he even met Roosevelt. He really was a Telegraph obituary writer's wet dream. But all things considered, not the sort of man you'd expect to find in a commando's green beret. By the start of the war, however, Mickey had seen the Nazi threat for what it really was and had found something else to suit his maverick streak, the commandos. People were left to make up their own minds. In war, anybody, everybody may be killed, and what decides the action may be the action of a private soldier who's left to command the trench. It wasn't put like that, but the feeling we were given that every single one of us might be imp as important as a brigadier. We were all individuals, you know. Discipline did matter, of course, but I wouldn't have said it was absolutely first. The commando forces were made up of volunteers from any of the regular army units, and the philosophy of how they went about their daily business was a million miles from that of the conventional military. For a start, they didn't bother with barracks or regimental headquarters because the commandos didn't want to waste training time on mundane chores such as cleaning or maintenance. Instead, they simply got digs in a nearby town. And there was no sergeant major on hand to tell them what to do every minute of the day. Instead of saying, parade tomorrow on the main square in Weymouth, it might be parade tomorrow at 10 o'clock on the, uh, in the marketplace at Dorchester and find your own bloody way there, you know. You weren't shouted at. There wasn't any of this shouting or bullying or anything that you got uh, in the regular army. You led by example. So, you know, uh, the officer had, uh, had to do everything that you did. If the officers can do it, I can do it. If the officers can do it. Unfortunately, though, the British Army top brass were a deeply conservative bunch, and they really didn't like the new commando philosophy. The regular army were doing their best to get us disbanded. They hated us, some of them. We were a nuisance. And because our standards were so high, we'd creamed off the best of the people in, in the regiments. And, in fact, a lot of, lot of COs uh, refused to allow people to volunteer. This resistance by the regular army certainly got Churchill's back up. What I have here is a letter he wrote to the Secretary of State for war. And he says... I hear that the whole position of the commandos is being questioned. They've been told no more recruiting and that their future is in the melting pot. Says he feels very strongly about this. Uh, says the defeat of France by Germany was accomplished by an incredibly small number of highly equipped elite while the dull mass of the German army came on behind. And then here, for every reason, therefore, we must develop the commando idea. Pretty clear cut. As 1941 drew to a close, Japan joined the war, and the Royal Navy had to send a fleet to the Far East. So there was even less to hold the Tirpitz at bay. 
What's more, we were losing the Battle of the Atlantic. We were losing in North Africa, and London was in ruins. So if Churchill's commandos really could smash up Saint-Nazaire, it might give a sense back home that Britain wasn't finished just yet. Everywhere, almost, we were on retreat, and people were really becoming negative, and Churchill wanted something which would be successful aggression. The plan to destroy the 1,500-ton dock gate was codenamed Operation Chariot, and it was certainly bold. The commandos would get hold of a couple of destroyers from somewhere and sail them from Cornwall over to Western France. Uh, now, one of these destroyers would be filled with explosives. And while the RAF distracted the Germans with a bombing raid over Saint-Nazaire, they would somehow sneak it up the estuary without being seen by anyone in the gun emplacements here, 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 and here. Uh, or by anyone uh, with a searchlight here, 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 and here. And then, to see what happens next, we have to turn to the actual model built to plan the raid. The destroyer, with the explosives in it, would ram the dock gates here, and the commandos would jump off, and right underneath all the guns uh, positioned to protect the U-boat pens here, they'd run around shooting anything that moved and uh, blowing up anything that didn't. Then... After the destroyer exploded, destroying the lock gate, they'd all meet here at this not at all exposed jetty and get back on the second destroyer, which somehow wouldn't have been blown to pieces while it was uh, hanging around in the estuary for a couple of hours waiting for them to finish. It would then sail back down the estuary, past all the guns, and go home. Right. The plan was presented to the War Office by Louis Mountbatten, head of the Combined Operations Unit. And unsurprisingly, it met resistance. One commander-in-chief was particularly vocal. I remember he started the meeting by saying, Well, Dickie old cock, if you're prepared to lose all your soldiers and all your ships, I suppose you can take on this task which I regard as absolutely impossible. I said, it's the fact that it is regarded as impossible, which makes it possible. The Germans will never think we'll attempt it. Matt Batten's enthusiasm certainly didn't rub off on the RAF. You can see here in these Operation Chariot minutes that the powers that be requested a force of about 100 aircraft uh, for the diversionary bombing raid uh, in three waves. But on the back, uh, Vice Marshal Sornby says, I don't agree that such a heavy scale of attack is needed. We want about 20 Whitleys, which are bombers, hanging around overhead, dropping an occasional bomb. And he's backed up by one of his advisers, this chap called Willits, who really says that Operation Chariot can... Uh, whistle for their 100 uh, bombers. He says Bomber Command can provide no more than 35 aircraft without prejudicing their other commitments. You might have thought the Navy would be keen, especially since the operation was designed to neutralise the Tirpitz. But no. The Commander-in-Chief here from Plymouth Command writes, uh, the plan entails the sacrifice of the landing party and endangers two valuable ships for a small chance of success. He actually says negligible chance here. And there's another guy writing here who says, um, I'm not hopeful as regards the result of the impact between the destroyer and the lock gates. I think the lock gates will remain partially intact and the destroyer will look silly. If that happens, much of the proposed plan fails. Eventually, though, the Navy did find one boat. It was called HMS Campbelltown, a clapped-out American World War I destroyer that was on loan to the British. She was not ideal for the job, known for her 
poor slow speed maneuverability and her large turning circle. But these drawbacks didn't dampen the spirits of the commandos. I thought we would get away with it, that I would be wounded romantically and a beautiful nurse would look after me in hospital. <laughs> I was very young. You were doing all this uh, heavy training and nothing's happening, so very frustrated. So I think when we were finally briefed on the model, I mean, we thought, well, hell, this is going to be something. We had been trained both in the dark, blindfolded in the day, in every form of demolition to do with dock demolitions, trains, anything. So when we heard that we were going to blow up the dock installations at Saint Nazaire, um, I suppose really uh, it was a feeling of elation. At this stage, people were saying, "Well, well, what do you think?" Be, you see. And I said, it's going to be a piece of cake. We're going to go in there uh, uh, and knock, sick, knock number six because that reflected the, the uh, optimistic attitude. We were going to go in there, blow up this bloody dock, and we'll be out. We had volunteered, after all, for danger. And there did seem an off chance that it was impossible, and therefore it would succeed. As the commandos prepared on land, the Navy set about the Campbelltown. The old tub would have to sneak past 80 gun emplacements on its way up the San Nazaire estuary, so it had to be disguised, and they only had 12 days to do the work. In the end, they removed two funnels and sloped the other two backwards, so at a glance it looked a bit like a German destroyer. And then there was the problem of turning it into a time bomb. This job was given to a brilliant young naval officer called Lieutenant Nigel Tibbetts. He was a shy chap with a stammer who, when his girlfriend announced that she'd become fond of him, replied, well, then I suppose we shall have to get married. However, while he was not desperately confident with women, he was a whiz with explosives, one of the best students the Dartmouth Naval College had ever seen. But even he faced difficulties with how you turn a whole ship into a bomb. The first problem he had was deciding where in the ship to place the explosives. Because, you see, if you can imagine this is the gate to the dock and this is the ship, what's going to happen after it hits? I mean, is it just going to end up here, in which case you want the bomb? in the front? Or is it going to rear up, in which case you want the bomb sort of in the middle, toward the bottom? I suppose, theoretically, it would be possible if the ship were going fast enough for it to actually ride right over the top of the gate and end up in the dock itself. I mean, who knew? Day and night, Tibbet struggled with this until he decided on a spot 40 feet back from the prow, low down, next to the keel. Then he had to work out how to set the explosives off. Back then, there was no accurate timing device, so he had to use fuses like this. The idea is that you squeeze the top part here, which breaks a glass capsule on the inside, releasing acid that then slowly burns through a strip of wire. Now, when that snaps, it releases a spring which boings out, setting off the detonator. Now, this was very advanced in 1942, but there were a couple of problems. First of all, it was very susceptible to jolts and shock. You wouldn't, for instance, want to ram some lock gates at 25 miles an hour with one of these on board, because it might go off instantly, killing everyone. It was also very vague. The strength of the acid varied from fuse to fuse, the strength of the wire varied, the tension of the spring varied. Tibbets couldn't say to within an hour when the bomb might actually go off. Choosing what explosive to use, however, was fairly straightforward. He went for Amatol, and to show how big a bang that produces, we've placed a pound of something similar between the front seats of this car. Three, two, one. 
That was a pound. Tibbets was going to use four and a quarter tons. Still, even if the explosives and the fuses could be trusted to work properly, and even if they could get across to France without being detected and up the estuary without being blown to smithereens, and even if the Campbelltown could hit the lock gates exactly right and the commandos could get off and do whatever it is they had to do, they still had a problem. How do they get home again? Because the Navy wouldn't provide a second destroyer, they were instead given 16 of these. Today, this Fairmile ML is a tourist boat taking trippers around Torbay, and certainly it's better suited to this than it ever was for Operation Chariot. They're made of Bakelite bonded plywood. It was a cheap, mass-production boat designed primarily to make the Navy look bigger than it really was. May God speed all who sail in her. It certainly wasn't particularly good in the open sea. It tended to roll badly in a swell, which made everyone on board queasy. It's not so bad if it was only used to bring the soldiers home, but this little fleet would also be used to get half the commandos out to San Nazaire as well. So there'd be 15 commandos wedged down here with all their kit. And when they got to the other end, they'd be expected to get out and start fighting immediately. It's a jury. There wasn't only seasickness to worry about, because while each ship had small guns fore and aft, it didn't have any armour. No, really. All that stood between the German guns and the men down here were, um... a few planks of wood. And to make matters worse, each boat was fitted with two 500-gallon long-range fuel tanks, which were completely exposed on the deck. Campbelltown was a bomb on purpose. These things... They were bombs by accident. Honestly, it's hard to think of any vessel less well-suited to the job in hand. The commandos were hard men, good fighters. But they'd been picked for their intelligence as well, so they must have known that the chances of getting to Saint-Nazaire were small, the chances of doing the job were microscopic, and the chances of them getting home again on a wooden boat, groaning under the weight of exposed fuel tanks past an alerted enemy were virtually non-existent. They must have known that Operation Chariot, for the vast majority, was going to be a one-way ticket. We were all of us told if we wanted to leave a letter for our next of kin, our loved ones, you could do so. And you wrote on the envelope to be posted in the event of my failing to return. Well, that's one, Sergeant Bill Gibson, who um, I knew them all very well indeed. And I remember seeing his face and I knew he knew he was going to be killed. My dearest dad, by the time you get this, I shall be one of the many who have sacrificed their unimportant lives for what little ideals we may have. I can only hope that by laying down my life, the generations to come might in some way remember us and benefit by what we've done. At a time like this, I turn to you, Dad, and God. I hope there will be peace for everyone soon. My love to everyone, I'll remember you. Your loving son, Bill. Somehow I thought it's unlucky to write your last letter to your parents. <laughs> no, my attitude was I'm coming back. Two of the uh, men came to me and said, would you take these letters home to our wives if we are killed? And I said, but wait a minute, I'm going with you. Oh, you won't be killed, I said. They were both killed. The San Nazaire raiders weren't allowed to reveal details of the operation to their loved ones. But for the bomb designer Nigel Tibbetts, recently married and the father of a young son, the thought of keeping his wife in the dark was too much. So he told her. And she said afterwards they both sort of knew he wouldn't be coming back. So, as the commandos gathered here in Falmouth in Cornwall, 
ready to join the Campbelltown and the little boats that were anchored out there in the bay. Lord Mountbatten gathered them all together and very unusually, he said to them that any man who wanted to step down could walk away without a stain on his character. Not one of them did. On the 26th of March 1942, the Armada set sail. With 264 commandos and 357 Navy personnel on board. That's a total of 621 men. Only 227 would come back. I had just enough. The night to, to read a book that I, that I was, was, was reading and I just concentrated on reading this book. The thought that crosses your mind is, I hope I'm going to be able to do my part, uh, you know, without being uh, overcome by, by fear. We chatted to each other about what we're going to do and I, we all went through it with our blokes, you know, I, I and my four guys just went through what we were going to do. I certainly thought to myself, my God, I hope I'm not going to show fear in front of my men if I'm frightened. Tense, I suppose, would be the thing. Uh, anticipation, yes. Fortunately, I think we were more worried about it, the, the, it being rough, because uh, it's very, uh, as you can imagine, physically exhausting to be seasick all the time. But we were lucky, it was calm. 33 hours later, they arrived at the mouth of the estuary and the captain of the Campbelltown, Lieutenant Commander Sam Beatty, instructed Tibbets to set the fuses on his bomb. He then began to creep up the estuary. Ideally, he'd have stuck to the deep water channel, the channel the Tirpitz would have used. But this would have meant hugging the northern shore right under the noses of the German sentries. So he had to go right down the middle, despite the fact that the water, even at high tide, was just 10 feet deep. To reduce the ship's draft, much of the heavy armor and the big guns had been removed. So if she did become grounded, She'd be a sitting duck. We did go across sandbanks a couple of times and dragged a bit going over. Um, but it was so quick that you hadn't got time to think, good God, if I'm marooned here, I'd be shot to pieces. It's hard to know, really, what the German gunners in this pillbox were doing when the Campbelltown chugged by. I mean, yes, she'd been hurriedly converted to look a bit like a German ship, but she was trundling right down the shallows. You'd have thought that would have alerted them to the fact something was up, but obviously it didn't, because they didn't open fire. And nor did the guns at the next pillbox, or the one after that. But then, things started to go wrong. The RAF had finally agreed to stage a bombing raid, but the pilots had been told not to bomb if there was cloud cover in case they hit French civilians. Unfortunately, it was cloudy, and they hadn't been told what to do instead. So they just flew around, alerting the Germans to the fact that something was up. Their flak guns turned very easily down onto the uh, surface of the river, plus their searchlights. With the Germans now suspicious, the Campbelltown's Heath Robinson modifications and fake German flag wouldn't fool them for long. And sure enough, they were soon challenged by a signal from the shore. But the British had a trick up their sleeves. We found the, um, the German code books, naval code books, and the Germans didn't know we had them. And so we had the up-to-date passwords, counter signs, and uh, we were using them much the consternation of the, the German signalman who was flashing signals asking who we were. And we were, we were flashing back the right answers. We're a friendly force coming in for the night. 
we've got a damaged ship or something like this, you see, and putting them off. Twice, the Germans opened fire, but each time they were silenced by reassuring signals coming from the Campbell Town. This meant the ships could get nearer and nearer to the target. Eventually, though, the Germans realized that, yes, unbelievably, it really was a British raiding party sailing right through their front door. They managed to get to this point here, just 2,000 yards from the dock gates, which are kind of just round the uh, headland. Maybe you can see it just over there. And all hell broke loose. There was an awful lot of stuff hitting Campbelltown. I mean, it was, it was absolutely hitting our poor little MLs, but the, uh, Campbelltown being the big target, you know, and... and uh, there was a sort of glare of searchlights. The air was filled with things that whistled, hummed and shrieked and everyone on lethal. The main focus for the German gunners was the bridge of the Campbelltown where the captain, Beatty, was trying to keep a steady course by calling out steering directions. The chap at the wheel was killed. His place was taken by another raider who was killed almost immediately. So then a chap called Montgomery, who was a Royal Engineer, took over and he was standing there thinking, what do I do with this? When suddenly there was a tap on his shoulder and a voice said, I'll take it, old man. And it was Tibbetts, the egghead, the brilliant scientist from Dartmouth, the man who designed the bomb in the bow, found himself at the wheel as the destroyer was on its final charge. I remember a red-hot shell passing through the wardroom just over our heads and going on out and didn't explode. If just one shell hit the rudder or the engine or worse, the bomb in the bow, the mission would be over. But at this point, it wouldn't have mattered because Beatty was lined up on the wrong lighthouse, so he was heading for the wrong target. At the last minute, a searchlight picked out the lighthouse over there, the green one, and Beatty realised his mistake. He barked out an order. So Tibbetts swung the wheel hard to the right to try and miss the jetty here, and then hard to the left again. And you've got to remember he's in a ship that doesn't handle doing 22 knots at night under a hail of enemy fire, and yet he managed to just graze the, uh, the jetty there. It is just an extraordinarily brilliant piece of seamanship. They came round the old mole, but really shifting at this point. And pretty soon you can pick out the dock gates. There they are, look. There they are. Maybe, I don't know, 500 metres to go. Really cranking it up now, the old girl. Imagine what it would have been like to have been doing this on that night in March 1942. Dark, searchlights, cannon, machine gun, massive fire coming from that bank, aiming straight for that. What's the impact going to be like? It's going to be huge. Reared up, putting Tibbetts' four-ton bomb right over the gate. And despite the firestorm, Beatty turned to his men and said, well, there we are, four minutes late. The Navy had done its part of the job brilliantly. And now, in the two and a half hours before Campbelltown blew, the army had to get ashore and create havoc. Yes, the Germans had fixed gun emplacements, and yes, they outnumbered the British by 20 to 1. But that was no problem, because the raiding party, remember, were commandos. They may have been picked for their intelligence and free thinking, but my God, they were tough. Fire!
The backbone of their training was speed marching, and each commando unit would compete to see who could go the furthest in the shortest time. One group went 63 miles in 19 hours, another marched 53 miles from Harlech to the top of Mount Snowden and then down again in 17 and a half hours. And remember, they did this while carrying 60-pound packs on their backs. Determination is the most important thing, even on speed marches, where our great aim was to get the chaps to do 15 miles in full kit in just under three hours, finish up on the salt course and firing, and then leisurely go up to the top of Ben Nevis. It's all part of mentally equipping them to do anything. Not only was commando training tough, but it was also revolutionary. The regular army would stay fit by doing star jumps in PE kit. The commandos trained in harsh terrain in battle dress. They invented the assault course. In fact, their methods were so advanced, they're still used by elite forces today. <laughs> determination, doing things which you thought you couldn't possibly do, like on the Tarzan course, on a rope bridge or the death slide. And don't forget, the chaps and commanders weren't super men. They were ordinary chaps from all walks of life, but they were trained well, trained to get the edge. <laughs> And instead of doing weapons training on rifle ranges, commandos practiced in massive mock battles with live fire. All the weapon training was geared to offensive action. A little example, the Bren gun was normally fired on the ground. But why not use it, firing it from the hip? And this was an innovation. And they weren't just revolutionary with guns either. They also learned unarmed combat, stuff no regular soldier had ever even heard of. How to tackle a bloke with your bare hands. Knock him out, spoil his prospects and pinch his weapon. And his gold watch too, if he's got one. The key element was getting themselves to convince themselves they could do anything. And you can only do that in the military sense if you train people to urge them on and overcome their inner fears and give them supreme confidence. Back in Saint-Nazaire, the commando raiding party would need all that confidence just to get ashore. We went up on deck and we went to the bows of the ship. Well, the 12 pounder uh, had been hit. There were a lot of dead bodies lying around the place, a lot of blood on the deck, and there was a hole in the deck. I remember Johnny Proctor lying there with his leg blown off, cheering us on. When I came up on deck, there was a brilliant flash and a ear shattering explosion and I felt a blow on my knee, which felt like a sledgehammer, uh, and it, it knocked my knee on one side, and I fell to the deck. And I was lying there, and suddenly somebody grasped the rucksack and pulled me on my feet and said, you're all right, lad, and it was Major Copeland. He said, bamboo lad at port side, don't hang about here, it's decidedly unhealthy. Tibbets and Goff were there, and they were holding the scaling ladders, and these two chaps were laughing swearing and so on and I think we probably dropped maybe even eight feet down onto the onto the dock and the next thing was uh, Germans and they said um, uh, handy hook and I said handy hook to you while Tiger was having a set to with Jerry, the demolition teams were on their way to their targets. One of the main targets was this underground bunker because down there, 
and I'm not absolutely certain how I actually get down there, but anyway, down there are the pumps that were used for emptying all the water out of the dock. Stairs. The job of smashing this place up was given to a team of four commandos led by Lieutenant Stuart Chant. Chant, a stockbroker in peacetime, had to place the explosives even though on the way to the pump house he'd been wounded in the left leg, the right arm and both hands. Unfortunately, the explosives had been pre-rigged in England with very short fuses. So, Chant sent his men back up to the surface in relative safety, knowing that when he lit the fuses, he'd have just 90 seconds to climb seven flights of stairs and find his way through this maze of aerial walkways in the pitch black, because there was no light down here then, while pretty badly wounded. He was a brave man. Chant made it. And the pumping house was gone. And meanwhile, other teams were having similar successes with the winding houses at both ends of the dock. I went up to my colonel and saluted him and said, so we've blown up the northern winding house. And he said, well done, old boy. So I said, I'm now ready to go back to England, sir. At half past two in the morning, the surviving commandos came here, where they'd arranged to meet the small boats that would take them home. They were pleased as punch with the way things had gone. But the elation was short-lived, because the scene that greeted them out in the estuary was truly horrific. Almost all of the wooden MLs with their exposed fuel tanks had been blown to smithereens. According to witnesses, the whole estuary was on fire. Chaps were drowning. There were pools of burning fuel on the water. You, you had to kick with your feet. I oh, had to try and steer the raft away from the rain, from the flames. And uh, it was an uh, absolute inferno. There was a sort of sea of black. You could see sort of sinking boats and hear shots coming from the river and so on. Um, and then very quickly, the colonel said, It was obvious that there was no transport home. So um, he said, Right, we'll fight our way out of the town and we'll split up into small groups and make our way severally across the Spanish border. I thought, uh, that's a bit uh, of a tall order. Spain was a daunting 350 miles away. But even before they could set off, they'd have to fight their way out of San Nazaire itself. So that's 5,000 Germans who by this stage were awake, alert and organised against fewer than 120 Brits, half of whom were wounded. If you're street fighting, you must secure any crossing. Tiger Watson came round this corner, found himself face to face with a German sniper. I ran forward, saw him lean forward, pressed the trigger of my Thompson submachine gun and typically Watson, the magazine was empty. Click, click. Unfortunately, his magazine wasn't empty and uh, his shot broke my arm and bowled me over. A party of Germans ran up to him and one of them actually used the cliched expression, for you, the war is over. And I thought, well, uh, I shall have to you know, escape eventually, but uh, don't feel quite up to it at the moment. <laughs> I knew, I was almost certain I'd be killed because there was a watch point, a tower, uh, and I had to go past it. The Germans must have seen me, and I knew they'd fire, and they did, but they hit me in the back and the arm and the leg. Chant, the stockbroker who'd blown up the pumping house, made it to this point when a machine gun bullet fired from the top of the U-boat pens over there. Took his knee joint out. 
He was no longer able to walk, so he was captured as well. The commandos realised that they were trapped on an island and that the only way off it and into the town was across this bridge, which was guarded by what must have seemed like half the German army. By the time they got here, there were only 80 of them left, but plainly, they still had some fighting spirit left because they just formed themselves into a sort of great big mass and charged. Captain Ryan now led the assault across the bridge. Streams of bullets hitting those girders, ricocheting off the roadway. Machine guns, pom-poms, rifles. It was like a damn good November the 5th, only more so. Bit by bit, the commando numbers were whittled down until the remaining men, low on ammo, went to ground in the town. Corin Purden ended up in a cellar. We suddenly heard all this shouting outside and then the door burst open and there were Germans standing there with their curl scuttle helmets and their weapons, looking terribly tense. Frankly, if I'd been there, I'd have chucked a, chucked a couple of hand grenades down and finished us off, but they didn't. And the colonel, who had his pipe in his mouth, just sort of walked up the steps and said, well, we've, we've done what we came to do, um, you know, that's that. As dawn broke, the battle was pretty much over. Just five of the landing party would eventually make it to Spain and freedom, and 222 would escape the horror on the few remaining wooden boats. Of the 600 or so men who'd come to France the previous evening, 214 had been taken prisoner, and 168 were dead. And worse still, it was now 7 a.m., three hours after the bomb in Campbelltown's nose was supposed to have gone off. After we were washed ashore, we were put in the back of the lorry, driven into the town, and we were in this, this big room, and they, the uh, Germans brought in a, a sailor, they fished out of the river and put him on the table and, and said, you know, you try and revive him. We, we tried to get the water out of his lungs, and by this time, uh, we were saying to one another, you know, the, the Campbell Town hasn't gone up. The British could only console themselves that despite the failure, they had at least fought like lions. They were patting us on the back there, the Germans were amazing. Yes, they, I mean, they probably couldn't believe it that, uh, that anybody would venture up into a submarine base heavily defended. Some of the stories of bravery were incredible. Out in the estuary, one of the surviving MLs had gone head-to-head -head with a much more powerful German destroyer. The British gunner, a commando called Sergeant Tom Duran, was asked to surrender on a number of occasions, but even though he'd been shot 16 times, he kept on firing until he was overcome by the loss of blood and passed out. But the story doesn't end there, because the captain of the German destroyer was so impressed by Durant's bravery but when he landed, he took the trouble to find the most senior British officer and said, look, I don't know who was on that gun on that little ship, but whoever it was should get your Victoria Cross. And he got it. One of five awarded as a result of the action that night. So the commandos had fought well, but all they had to show for it was a destroyed pumping house and two damaged winding stations. Even at 10 a.m., the Campbelltown still hadn't exploded. And by this stage, the ship was crawling with German souvenir hunters. There was a real possibility the bomb might be discovered and diffused. At one point in the morning, Mickey Byrne was marched along here, right past where the Campbelltown was embedded in the gates. And that called for a remarkable piece of acting. He couldn't look pleased that it was crawling with Germans. He couldn't look quizzical, wondering why the bomb hadn't gone off. And nor could he look afraid that it might go off at that precise moment, blowing him to pieces. Among the prisoners was the Campbelltown's captain, Sam Beatty, who was being held in a nearby hut. I was interrogated by a German who spoke very good English. 
he discovered that I'd been in Campbelltown, and he was remarking that it was no good ramming a stout cassoon like that with a flimsy ship. At that moment, there was a bang. The blast wrecked the gate. Thousands of gallons of water roared in, taking what remained of the British ship with it. And the German souvenir hunters? They found bits of them on the roof of the U-boat pens, 400 yards away. A German petty officer rushed into the room where we were lying, saying, we're going to shoot you all, we're going to kill you all. We just were so sort of exhausted and everything else that we were delighted that the explosion had occurred and just said, oh, do, please don't shout, just get on with it. Hitler was so incensed that he later issued his infamous order that in future all captured commandos would be executed as spies. Small wonder, damage to the Normandy dock was so comprehensive that it was not repaired until 1947, two years after the war was over. As a result, Tirpitz was denied a home base in the Atlantic, and as a result of that, she was forced to spend most of the war in a fjord in Norway. She was finally destroyed by RAF bombers in 1944, and incredibly, this mighty battleship, the pride of the German Navy, went to the bottom, having never sunk so much as a fishing boat. In the smoke of giant explosions, the turpids capsizes and sinks. The price for rendering this great ship impotent had been high. 168 British dead, around 400 Germans and 16 French, shot by mistake by SS troops. Still, the attack did mean that Churchill could say to the British and the world, we're not done yet. And it helped in France as well. One very important thing is what the French Prime Minister said to us on our first return to Saint-Nazaire. He said, you were the first who gave us hope. And what of the men, the commandos and the sailors who brought them on this, the greatest raid of all? Well, Tommy Durrant, the sergeant who took on a German destroyer, was captured and died of his wounds shortly afterwards. The bomb designer, Nigel Tibbetts, after he'd steered the Campbelltown into the dock gate, helped wounded men onto a nearby ML and headed for home but his little boat was hit by machine gun fire and, as his wife had predicted, he was killed. After being captured, Mickey Byrne was sent to Colditz. After the war, he became a journalist, and today he lives in Wales, where his hobby is reading poetry. What a world we might have made. Tiger Watson was sent to the Spangenberg camp. After coming home, he qualified as a doctor and ended up in Africa, helping victims of leprosy. I can't imagine all of our senses being so alert. You know, every sense of hearing and looking and your heart pumping. Well, certainly will be the most exciting thing of my life. It made you feel that you you could stand up to the test. I think that was a relief to know that one didn't fall apart. I'm sure the youth of today would do the same as we did. I'm sure they would. I think that somehow or other, it's a, such a strange thing, the phlegmatic British 
do this sort of thing, and I could see us doing it again. But I'm always reminded when I think about this, and it was after the war I came across a quotation by Mark Twain, who said that uh, courage is uh, recognising fear, courage is conquering fear, and it's absolutely true, couldn't be truer. Yes, you were afraid, but you couldn't afford to be a coward. Today, the great moments of military history are marked with imposing monuments and their anniversary is honoured with much pomp and ceremony. But to find a memorial to the greatest raid of all, you have to go to a car park in Falmouth, in Cornwall. It's just a rock propped up against some railings, and it seems rather small. I've always had the feeling that anything that really offers some hope, whether it's international or national or even individual, some idea of your own, and it's impossible, never think so. Try it. Good night. This graphic sequence represents a landmark piece of television. Never before has the subject of a World War II documentary been rendered so vividly, placing viewers at the heart of the greatest reign of all. A careful search through the film archives showed that there was no contemporary footage of the mission. So how did Jeremy Clarkson and his producers illustrate the enormous HMS Campbelltown smashing into the epic dock here at Saint-Nazaire? Well, they did it in miniature. They literally brought a little bit of Hollywood to the small screen, enlisting the help of cinema's preeminent model makers. This behind the scenes look will reveal how they built, filmed, and edited the real life mission that sounds like a blockbuster movie. Jeremy found the story of uh, the San Nazaire raid. Um, he literally did come across it in a book. He rang me really excitedly and he said, no one's ever heard of it. And I was like, well, probably a few have, but he was right in terms of there was a damn good story there, ripe for the telling. Amazingly, they it is a, a true, genuine Mission Impossible. Fill a boat with explosives, a really crappy, rubbishy old boat, get it past all those Germans, don't get it grounded, smash into those docks, five tons of explosives, go, and then they can't get home again. I mean, there's every, it's a screenplay writer's template for a war movie, it's the Dirty Dozen. But just filming at present day Saint-Nazaire wasn't going to be enough to do the story justice. It was crucial that the explosive climax of the raid was somehow brought to life. The classic one that directors always say is, what we'll do is come up with something special and we'll let the public use their own imagination and fill in the blank cells. What that means is we've run out of money and we're going to fade to black. And I don't think we can do that anymore. 
So they went to Cinesight, a visual effects company used to working with Tim Burton and Jerry Bruckheimer on films ranging from Harry Potter to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and V for Vendetta, where their Houses of Parliament model was indistinguishable from the real thing. You go in and you say, right, now, what we'd like to do is... This. And then, obviously, like all TV people on the scrounge, you ask for more, you know. We'd like to show the ship like this and then like this and then we'd like to see it going up there and then maybe half an hour of that and then we'd like an explosion and maybe some satellites and Paris could be in the background maybe and then maybe 4,000. And they're like, yeah, right, and we've got nine pounds. The decision to do it wasn't based on, it wasn't a financial decision or, or you know, it, it was just really the, the subject matter it seemed to uh, strike a chord with everybody. I think it's just, just so interesting that we keep these things in the public's mind of these, you know, such brave guys, you know, much younger than me, who, who went off and, and did these acts and uh, didn't even know if they were going to come back. And, uh, you know, I just think it's a, it's a good timely reminder that we do these things and, you know, it's for a visual effect company equally, it's exciting stuff to do. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's not, you know, the Harry Potters are lovely and, you know, we, we really enjoy doing those, but, you know, this is a bit action managed. The project was underway, and while Jeremy was dispatched to France, construction of the miniatures and landscapes hurriedly began. They had just 12 weeks to complete not one, but two sets of models. For close-up shots, a large ship would be needed. For wider shots, a smaller scale would be necessary. We got hold of a, a model from the States, um, about $300 worth of model, which unfortunately wasn't particularly impressive. In fact, the model arrived two weeks late, and it was immediately obvious the detail was nowhere near convincing enough. What they thought was a useful shortcut wasn't even symmetrical. Valuable days had been wasted, and now everything would have to be built from scratch. That's no mean feat. You simply can't go and knock on the Royal Navy's door and ask for a set of blueprints. The team was forced to work largely from just a few key photographs, but were adamant that the replicas of the Campbelltown and its supporting convoy had to be exact. This is a documentary, so if, if we don't get the thing accurate, then really we, we haven't done our jobs. We've got photos of most of the boat, but there's bits we're missing and we have to sort of make assumptions, but really we'll, we'll go to town and get it, get it as close to the original as possible. Judging measurements for the models was a painstaking task, and often they'd have to estimate heights and widths by using people in the photographs as a yardstick. The biggest struggle, really, I had was trying to find out what all the shapes were in the picture. It's, it, you can see a blob, but to actually make that blob and make it look like something, that was quite difficult. I mean, these are going to be seen in the dark from a bit of a distance. You're not really going to see an awful lot of detail, but what you do see to get the lines right and the shadows right, you've got to build it right. So it, it's quite important to get as fine detail as you can possibly into these things, which then means a lot of time building and quite a lot of money. With most of the money being spent on models, out on location, the crew had to make do without the luxury of an official translator. Okay. In, you know, we have at the, the old, the Viet Mall. We? Oui? Oui? Campbelltown, yeah. Avant Port, okay? Foot speed. Now, wrong. A boite. Okay. A we a gauche. That'll be fine. With three weeks left to go, do the model makers think that everything's going according to plan? Yeah, I do. I do. Ish. We were on schedule enough for, to not lose sleep about it. So that's what I'm sticking to anyway. The huge amount of background buildings were beginning to take shape. We're casting up all the chimneys and some dormer windows and ridges and things like that as we go along. So to do that doesn't actually take that long, but there are just so many of them to do, you know. While major landmarks like the pump house had been beautifully crafted in both scales and were looking remarkably like the real thing. But for ultimate realism, it's not sufficient to just have a set of perfectly measured replicas. The materials used also play a crucial part. For example, the best material to use for the hull is pewter. 
the thing with the pewter is you don't get a totally smooth finish. And in, <laughs> in this particular case, we don't want a smooth finish. This is an old vessel. She's had a long life, 30 odd years, which is quite a way for a destroyer. So you don't want a pristine factory finish on a ship like this. She was chosen because she was you know, near the end of her life, expendable, and uh, want that to reflect in the, the decking and the side panels and everything. But it's not just for aesthetic reasons that pewter works so well. I used ideally for this kind of job, which is very soft, not too heavy, and behaves very much like scaled down steel wood. And it's, um, it doesn't corrode, which in this particular case is rather useful. Um, and also it will be, when we blow this thing up, you will get the sort of bending and shard creating effects that you get with real metal, you know, this sort of thing. Creating the millions of rivets on the hull looks like a time-consuming task, but there's a rather neat trick of the trade that sped the whole process up. Basically, the pewter's put down on a soft surface, and you have a roller like this, which has different sort of teeth on, it's a cog, and basically you just press and run. And there you go, a line of rivets. Quick, easy. Mm and uh, pretty realistic, especially when it's painted. But before the painters could arrive, they needed one final push to complete construction. The build on this, I'd say, is running at um, approximately 50 man weeks. As far as I know, it's quite unprecedented for, for TV, but um, so here it's, you know, it's what we do. After a lot of midnight oil, the 24-foot-long Campbelltown was in good shape. The painting is an art in itself. It's not the paint you put on, but the paint you take off that counts. Everything is sprayed down with water to blend the colours and give it the salty, weathered look. Rust is added with thought, trying to show where ropes would have rubbed or water would have run down from a joint. Handrails are made shiny, and the middle of steps made to look worn. Working from photographs to try and get the details correct, everything is made to look as realistic as possible. Similarly, the dock walls are given the spritzer treatment, making them look like they've endured the ravages of the sea. Saint Nazaire is an exposed bit of coast. Just ask the director. Luckily, Jeremy was on hand to offer moral support. With the model unit ever more committed to the project, everyone started staying late to crank up the level of detail. Brass was milled with millimetric precision to create lifelike railings. String can be made to look like rope on some occasions, it just doesn't sag realistically enough, so a special form of bungee is used instead. I'm convinced we got more than we paid for with that. There are men doing a bit more after work. There are men saying, let's make that thing look good, you know, which is right and proper because those guys went off in 42. They weren't going to come back as a suicide mission. I'd rather be doing what we're doing now than what they went through on their one, to be honest with you. But yeah, it's, uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of fitting. Pictures of the astonishing details were sent to Jeremy, and he was amazed. That's the Campbelltown before they altered it. And the Campbelltown, when they was made disguised as a German ship, had they removed one funnel and tilted the other two back so it looked German. It's a lot more detailed than I thought it was going to be. Oh, beautiful. But we are going to have to get small children to run around on the deck to give it the scale in German uniform. And so, after six frenzied weeks in the workshop, the crew moved to the shooting stage at Bray Studios. While the lights and film cameras were rigged, last-minute finishing touches were added to the models. The thing they built this Campbelltown, 20-odd feet long, 
probably cost as much as the real bloody Campbelltown, you know? And it is awesome, it's impressive, it's a fantastic thing. You are doing the most realistic thing with a TV budget that you can do. Against all the odds, they've made a masterpiece. It would have taken too long and too much money to create a computer-generated Campbelltown that could stand such close-up scrutiny. Every texture was perfect. I'm very, very pleased with it. Um, I mean, you consider how, how short a build time the chaps have had. They've done all of this in six weeks with a very small crew. You know, not just this, but the environment that's in scale with it. Like everybody's worked very hard on this. Original discussions revealed 25 shots would be needed. The rough sketches of the first storyboard had now been turned into graphical representations, so the whole crew could visualise what the model had to do. A larger model could have actually been put to sea for ultra-realistic filming, but the 13th scale Campbelltown had to be filmed inside a bespoke 60-foot water tank. We've just added um, some emulsion stainers into it, just to give it that um, you know, sort of estuary dock feel, sort of dirty, dirty, muddy water, rather than a, a sort of bluey Mediterranean feel to it. The reason models look rubbish in like Thunderbirds and stuff like that is the scale. There's a certain size of length of water where a wave, you know, if the boat's that big, the waves around it will look like the ones in your bath. And you can just tell the, the surface tension on the water is evident. So um, what was that other one? Voice at the Bottom of the Sea or any of those other ones. I mean, they're fantastic in their day. But you know it's like a little thing going boom and then and everyone's like six feet around it and everything. Luckily, there were a variety of high-tech methods on hand to try and create the right-sized waves. Huh? Can I have that dustbin? Short, fast ones so that keep the waves nice and small. Uh, me, I'm a wave maker now. So there's me wave stick, ready to go. <laughs> Scale, waves. Scale waves, yeah, keep them nice and small. Maybe not too many bubbles, but we're, we're so far back, over the bubbles would have popped by the time they get down there. So, yeah. Tracks were laid on the floor so a camera and the model could be pushed on a consistent line. And some finishing touches were made to the landscapes. It is genuine seaweed, picked, hand-picked yesterday. With the set built, the elaborate task of lighting could begin. Practically the most important part of the whole operation. If you light a model badly, you can almost kill it. So there's certain things that we try and do to, to help the model, and there's a tendency with model photography to want to sort of three-quarter light, backlight or side light. If you just come too far forward, it can start to flatten things out too much. At the end of the day, you, 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 you're chasing reality. You want something to look real. Just as important as lighting the Campbelltown is lighting the green screen background. This needs to be consistent in colour, so that later on, during the editing process, a computer can change anything that's green into a proper sky. What helps the shot look even more realistic is the addition of some well-wafted smoke. It's sort of common practice, really, to put some smoke in just to help um, sort of depth cue it. Give some atmosphere, you know, it's the equivalent of if you were on a, outside on a you know, mountain range, the, the distant mountains would be hazy and you'd get that sort of ha natural haze effect. Just before filming began, the ship was inspected with a fine tooth comb and Jose decided to swap a rope. It's not heavyweight enough, it would be... Um, for a ship of this size, you'd have a much heavier gauge of rope to be anoraki about it. To begin with, filming progressed relatively quickly. The first real test came with shot number 22, where the Campbelltown drives straight into the dock gates. It was an audacious manoeuvre, emotively described by Jeremy. That's the best piece of camera I've ever done. Lighting's on one of my shoots. I've never done one as good as that. You know, with an absolute yeah. rain, the actual lighthouse, 
what actually happened, knowing what I'm talking about, not trying to remember my lines. Brilliant. The model unit had a lot to live up to. Back during the construction stage, the balsa wood bow had been carefully weakened to try and make sure it would behave and crumple like the real thing. Nobody was really certain if it would work, and of course, because of time and money, they needed to get it right first time. So how hard should they push the boat? In the real event, I mean, they just had the engines on, on full whack and just steamed straight into the gate, and uh, it just did its own thing. We're not going to really take any risk. I'm just going to let them drive it, drive it home until it physically stops and they can't push it any further. You know, there's enough inertia. We've got uh, the best part of 28 stone behind it, so I don't think we should have too much trouble. It is a bit nerve-wracking. Okay, roll cameras. Turn over. Three cameras. Far up the smoke. So turn over. Right. That's all right. Hang on, roll cut. No. It's on fire. Nice one. Looks like they overdid it on the smoke. After a quick rejig and with everyone's nerves just that little bit more frayed, they were ready to go again. Speed all round. And action. And cut it. Cut in there, boys. Stop that better for this camera. It's perfect. Good. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Bang on, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's what we wanted. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. Look at that. And then the smoke, yeah, the, the, the impetus of the smoke yeah, yeah, catches yeah, the ship yeah, up. Yeah. Good, huh? And so it was time for the shot, codenamed Kaboom, where the explosives hidden inside the Campbelltown detonate. Jose's team has a reputation for great pyrotechnic effects. They tested special cocktails of gunpowder to create different scale explosions. The main lifting charge is this one, which is purely a fine black powder. That gets made up into a charge, yeah. basically a plastic bag. Back with PVC tape to give it some compression, and those helps get the burn going quicker. We then have yeah. naphthalene, yeah. which gives a nice sort of fireball-y type effect. Pretty much it. I'm using uh, mothballs, which is a nice, nice red flame. That's CD8, this is. Um, it's basically a low-energy detonator, um, just about capable of setting off high explosive. We're going to be using that to lift off the metal plates because they've got a lot of expansion, a lot of energy, a very physical small size. The firing box is relatively low tech. As each peg is struck, it completes the circuit and fires the explosive sequentially. It's all in the timing and requires a steady hand. It's a job, so... I'm going to try and cut it up there. I'll probably do it myself, so if it goes wrong, it's only myself to blame. After five hours of rigging, the success of Kaboom relied on a confusing snake's nest of fuse wire. This is a one-hit wonder. So everything relies on, on this one take. It's great fun working towards it, but then when you get there on the day or a couple of days lead up to the event, then obviously you're, you're very... Um, preoccupied with what you're about to do and you know gone are the days where you'd be given three or four goes at getting a big shot like that right you, these days people just want to pay for you to do it prep it and do it once and you know get it right first time which is wrong really but um, that's just the way it works these days it puts an awful lot more pressure on us to get it right you will sense as the time goes by the atmosphere does change yeah because it's it is a culmination of a lot of people's efforts and we do want to try and get it right in memory of the people you know that are on the actual raids it's what we live for it's it's great stuff as long as it, as long as we get the shot 
you know, that's what we're all nervous about. I mean, if the thing ends up in, in bits, as long as we've got the shot, it doesn't matter. It's uh, what we built it for. Uh, yeah, sort of goodbye and thanks for all the fish, really, isn't it? <laughs> well, without sounding completely obvious, uh, I think this might get slightly loud. This would be big. This would be good. And that's spade. It was all over in a flash, and nobody would really know if the shot had worked until they examined the footage in slow motion. Okay, cut. Cameras are cut there. Our friends across the uh, across the pond tend to uh, whoop and holler and make a bit more of a deal of it, but um, I don't know. I tend to get a bit. I tend to go quite quiet during those events because um, again, there's too much at stake, and you, you know, you just spent three or four hours rigging something, and you've got one model. You know, you don't have an opportunity opportunity of doing it twice. You just it's got to be right. Very good. Very Relief. pleased with it. Relieved? Yes. The end. Well, it was certainly the end of filming, but not the end of the project. The footage had to be rushed into post-production, where computer-generated effects could be added to embellish the shots. For a feature film, this amount of work would take about three months to sort out. Here, the five-man team had just three weeks. This is... Well, the, the first shot, basically, of um, the Campbell Town in Falmouth. Um, so it's the establishing shot, if you like, of the, um, the documentary. So I'll just quickly show you the final shot we have here, which is quite different. We obviously have the, the, the main model of the boat itself. That's what was shot down at the studios. Moving water that was shot on location down at uh, Weymouth. Then we have photographs of these buildings made in, making up the harbour. The cranes were separate elements. They were extracted and put on. Um, the, the rolling hillside in the background, that's um, a separate element from a photograph, as was the sky, a separate element. Then we have the moving elements, which is the bilge pumps just coming out of the, the boat there, just at the bottom, and the, the bird just popping in. So, Quite sort of subtle, small movements, but they just go together to make the, the shot work. That's a relatively simple shot. Some require up to 30 layers. Here, transforming a boring angle of the ship's nose into a dramatic point of view, placing the viewer slap bang in the middle of the Campbelltown under fire. The other main ingredient in the shot is the tracer fire, and we've developed specifically for this um, documentary uh, a, a plug-in for the compositing package that we use, which um, generates tracer fire. Um, you've got lots of sort of controls on it, the, the speed, the, um, the gravity as it drops off, um, and the, the rebound when it hits things. A lot of sort of research was done into how tracer actually reacted, so we've hopefully got that quite accurate. Unsurprisingly, it was the final explosion that took most work. There's still quite a lot going on uh, here in terms of layers. Uh, the engines were still running. We've added smoke coming from the engines. A lot of the buildings were still smouldering, so there's still smoke lingering around. In an ideal world, it would have been to three times that. We, obviously, you, you can be a far more aggressive and put a lot more into the recipes of the bangs and, and get even more smaller detail working for you. But, yeah, considering... Considering what we were working with, I think it's, uh, I'm very happy with it. It's a good result. Although it's the dramatic fireball that dominates, the most labour-intensive part was adding in the soldiers. Look over towards us, over this way. These highly trained actors are then digitally manipulated and can be placed anywhere in the scene. That's good. 
The final stage is to add in sound effects. They're the finishing touch that help make the sequence as convincing as possible. Compare the mute version with the final version. I'm not asking the public to believe that's real, you know. We've built a hundred and odd foot long boat and we've gone and rebuilt the docks and done them. Or we've gone, we've built a time machine and gone back with a camera and filmed the moment. The public are too TV savvy. So, hey, people are gonna work out that's a reconstruction. What I'm hoping is I'll go, yes, you've done it justice and you haven't, you haven't insulted my intelligence with what you've shown me. And I think we've definitely done that. After 12 weeks, the Cinesight crew of 40 people had created a sequence that illustrates the raid on Saint-Nazaire better than ever before. This incredible mission was in danger of being forgotten. Hopefully now it's easier for people to visualise quite what true heroism is all about. Next. <laughs> going to do next. Well, there were 10 million troops in the Red War. 